Order, please. Yeah, I could try. <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the. You okay? Yeah, yeah. Thank okay. The June uh, 2022 Finance Committee of the MTA Board. I want to first welcome our. I don't. Let's see who's in the video. Is Sammy on the video? Is Blanc on the video? No, no. Okay, well, I, oh, there's Sammy down there. He's down at the bottom. Okay. I want to welcome our uh, four new members of the Finance Committee, Sammy, Blanca, Sharif, and Lisa. Welcome aboard. You're joining the, the second most populous committee, but certainly the most important committee, I would say, especially as the July plan comes into focus uh, next month. So get, get ready for some fun. Uh, I promise this will be an efficiently run committee and um, probably pretty interesting and maybe put you out of your comfort zone in terms of your your uh, knowledge and expertise. It'll be a fun one. So thank you for joining us and uh, looking forward to having you aboard. Okay, uh, Mark, public speakers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We have one public speaker, Jason Anthony. Hey, Neil. After being uh, out of town for two whole weekends, uh, I want to. Do you know why I was out of town the last two weekends? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I know, Neil, but I want to bring idea that I saw in a city called Chicago. That I saw that I want to bring into consideration. That I found quite interesting that will save our Rent-A-Ponte Transportation Authority, better known as the MTA, a lot of money. It will bring a lot of riders into our beloved system. Their weekly passes are, believe it or not, Neil, half off. Hmm, that's a big deal. Half off. So, what, let's cut off our expenses, save our money, and let's not throw money under the bus and things we're not supposed to do, and let's bring people back to the city like we're supposed to do, and let's spend money wisely. So, I'll see you guys again Wednesday morning. Okay, thank you very much, Jason. Okay, approval of the minutes, please. Can I get a motion to approve the May minutes, please? Our second. Oh. Well, let's move it first, then you can make your edits, and then we'll vote. Sure. So, I got a motion, I got a second. Robert's rules say you do that first, then you can comment. So, discussion, please. Sure. So uh, on page seven, uh, I'm quoted as saying Discre discretionary travel has returned faster than discretionary travel. Obviously, I said travel to work on the second one. Otherwise, it makes no sense. And then on page 11, um, it says chief financial officer and Kevin Willen's name has been left out. It should be inserted. And then it says the market existing the rail industry when it should say exiting. So with those corrections, I move that they be approved. Who is the uh, minutes uh, editor? Uh, partly myself. Um, we had a, a staff member who was ill, uh, and, okay. and so I, my, my bad. So <laughs> Well, I didn't mean that as a criticism. I meant oh. that just who's, who's capturing the notes. Oh. But you are chief cook and bottle washer, obviously. Yeah. Well, uh, so uh, thank Mar you. Marcia is, is uh, joined us uh, remotely, and, and she's uh, you there, Marcia? Chair Zuckerman, I'll, I'll make those changes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, other corrections, edits, deletions? Uh, I took note you left my name off. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's like Game of Thrones here, ladies and gentlemen. Lisa, Sharif, Sammy, now you note the intensity of the review of the minutes. You, you can actually leave that to Andrew going forward. If you felt like there was something you wanted to do, you don't have to do it. Any other comments? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions. Okay, great. All right, Mark, Budget Watch, please. Yes, thank you. Um, budget Watch was included in the exhibit book, uh, as well as on mta.info. Um, um, 
uh, this month we are comparing uh, operating results through May. Um, and we also, as typically you're aware, we get an advance on the uh, uh, receipts on subsidies. So we have that information through June. Um, you'll notice at the, the top of uh, Budget Watch, we are, we're comparing in that table, we're comparing May year-to-date results uh, to the adopted budget. Um, and it shows that at the end of that month, we had a, this is fiscal 22 only, uh, a surplus of $269 million year-to-date. And the theme is similar to what we've uh, talked about in the last few ses sessions. Uh, we're seeing operating expenses significantly below budget. Uh, the subsidies coming in above budget, uh, offset uh, at least partially in great deal by the uh, revenues that are coming in much lower than, than budget. Um, so looking at some of those uh, figures in, in a little bit greater detail, um, again, you've heard a lot today in the earlier committees about ridership. Uh, I, I heard Kathy Rinaldi talk about some <laughs> records had been set. Um, so ridership does continue to grow. However, we're way below pre-pandemic levels and uh, significantly below the, the budget for 2022. Uh, so during the, uh, for example, during the month of May only, uh, passenger revenue fell $50 million below the budget. And year to date, we were $288 million below the budget. Uh, on the other hand, toll revenues continue to do relatively well and exceed projections, uh, and they were $35 million above the budget through, uh, through the end of May. Um, then taking a look at expenditures, operating expenses, again through the end of May, we were $329 million below budget. That's really, uh, there's two main pieces, uh, labor-related spending, non-labor-related spending. On the labor-related side, uh, that was $145 billion below budget, and that's largely being driven by the vacancies that are budgeted and unfilled. Uh, at the end of May, there were 4,279 vacancies across the MTA, and about 3,100 of those were non-reimbursable positions. Uh, overtime expenditures are exceeding budget. Uh, they were $103 million above budget through the end of May. Uh, and that's mostly absentee and vacancy coverage at New York City Transit. Uh, on the non-labor side, we're also seeing significant surpluses. That was $184 million year to date. Uh, that's mostly due to timing uh, of you know, engagements, whether it's material purchases, uh, material usage, contractual spending. Uh, and debt service was $26 million favorable through May. Um, moving towards subsidies, again, a similar theme that we've talked about the last few sessions. Uh, through June, this is more up-to-date information, uh, they were $216 million favorable. Uh, primary driver of that positive result uh, is real estate transaction taxes. Uh, which continue to show strength, uh, and they were $256 million favorable through, through June. Payroll mo mobility taxes are also favorable. On the flip side, uh, continued uh, petroleum business taxes uh, for higher vehicle surcharge uh, were below budget. So we continue to monitor these results as we go through 2022 and develop the July plan. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Yeah, Andrew, go ahead. The uh, state suspension of the gas tax, have we felt that impact as of yet? So if you remember, we're held harmless. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the gas tax holiday just took effect in, in, in June, which will affect July receipts, and our first installment of the hold harmless is in July. So... There's been. Is there you, any you, time frame of the hold harmless? I mean, if if we don't get it by a certain date. No, it's a. F they've put in their, f you know, financial plan a monthly amount that they're going to oh, send okay, send great. us as the uh, hold harmless. You'll notice in here there is a decline in the petroleum business tax. That's due to remember that's a volume tax. So when you know volume goes down, that impacts us. That was not subject to the gas tax holiday, just normal, um, you know, change in, in consumption and, and taxes. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Norman? Yeah, I didn't get why the um, 
by looking at the budget watch, I, I couldn't get why the urban tax um, deviates so far from the um, uh, adopted numbers. The um, remember the urban tax, which is based on real estate transactions. First of all, it's very hard to forecast, right? It takes the number of real estate transactions. The benefit to why we achieve such above budget numbers were early in the year in January, February, there were a lot of holdover transactions from the previous year that got delayed because of Omicron or whatever, but closed. But we saw a big surge in tax receipts that came from, you know, again, it's the, the, um, the value of the transaction and the quantity. So we just, again, it's very volatile. We've seen, you know, real estate, it's, it's not millage like on property tax, it's on transaction. So it's something that's hard to forecast We've had a big benefit. We're going to be conservative for the balance of the year on it because there's some concerns around, you know, both the uh, urban tax and the mortgage recording tax in terms of, you know, with higher interest rates, how much of that real estate activity will slow. We look at the city does some projections on urban tax and mortgage recording tax, and we incorporate that in. Um, thank you for assuming I knew what millage meant. <laughs> um, Just a... Uh, you know, plain property tax on your assessed valuation, which is very stable. So in sc mostly mm -hmm. school districts get property tax. Well, right? what I'm really yep. I'm curious about, and I suppose this, you maybe already explained it to me, but why does it deviate so much from the MRT? Why does the urban, I mean, is it, this is a deal where people, this, this means that people were buying and selling who didn't need to finance? Is that what it means? There's, there's, two, there's, there's two transactions. Or I mean, there's a mortgage recording tax. Which is two transactions. Right. right. And then the second is a real property transfer tax. So even if you don't get a mortgage, if you buy and sell a piece of property in the city, there's also transfer tax on it. Uh, there's, al there's also, I believe, the mortgage recording tax has two components. One is commercial transactions, and one is individual transactions, where the urban tax is a different base of, of transactions. So it may not be one for one. Um, also, the urban tax is city only. The mortgage recording tax is the whole transportation district. But I think you would see stress in both from a cooled real estate well market. Well so. so as long as one of them is, <laughs> as long as one of them is feeding you, you're you're going to. They're be highly okay. correlated, I guess, is what is what our, our CFO is saying. So the problem is, unless, unless people don't finance their transactions, they just go buy them with cash. You're going to see them both. I'm sure historically, Matt, Mark, they're they're highly correlated. Other questions? For our new new committee members, if the if the alphabet soup of revenue sources that the MTA yeah, has, ask please ask. They are footnoted in the budget watch. I highly recommend you reading it. It is an attachment in the in um, the NASDAQ tool we have here, but uh, they are, as Norm is proving, you, we all need a constant reminder of the alphabet soup of them. But so if I say there are a lot, and that's good. Okay, Mark, others, other things? No? Any further questions for Mark on Budget Watch? Okay, so I, I asked Kevin just to give a couple of minutes for the current and new board members or committee members on the next month as we lead up to the July plan. It's a big, uh, it's a big moment usually for us, but more in particular is there's a new study that we're commissioning to reassess uh, the forecast of ridership, which is obviously a huge driver of the other half of our revenue. So, Mr. CFO. Thanks. Um, yes, in uh, next month, we'll be putting out the July financial plan, which is um, really an update to the current year budget, as well as an update to the out year forecasts. And for the first time, we'll give us a, a look at 2026, which gets added in every July, we add in the year that's left off. So it, it, it'll show us projections from 22 through 2026 it you know being an update um, there's no action in other words we're not asking the board to take action on a modified 
budget for for the year just to keep in mind of how the budget cycle works you know really the start of the budget year is in November where we publish a November financial plan that leads to a board vote in December on the budget for that year so the November financial plan that occurred this last November had a had a proposed budget for the current year 2022 and what the out years look like 23, 4, and 5. February, and then that gets voted on December as an approved budget. February, or there's technical adjustments to the budget. This year, one of the big adjustments was a, a reforecast of subsidies coming from New York State, which had an impact on our ability to uh, not move on the, on the, uh, the fare, and, fare increase. Um, but usually February is just a, a, a technical adjustment incorporating some of the executive budget items, so forth and so on. So this July, again, we'll be updating, adding a year on. The big difference is the, 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 the current year budget and the current year out year forecasts are based on a ridership projection that was done by McKinsey back in late 2020 because of, of, of COVID, where they projected you know, two recovery scenarios to ridership based on their view of the unwind of the pandemic and so forth. We budgeted and our out-year plan had the mid, what we call the midpoint of those kind of you know, best case, worst case scenario. Um, the update that we're going through with them right now is a fresh look at what ridership looks like through 2026. There's been a lot that's happened since late 2020, the last time the report was done in terms of, you know, more long, you know, longer term trends that have now become apparent or that look like they've accelerated, you know, most notably, you know, work from home and hybrid uh, work and how that impacts our, our ridership, um, safety and, um, you know, perception of, of transit and the acceleration in e-commerce, um, which has had an impact on non-work related related trips. So that'll be the first look of how these, you know, again, uh, we're gonna have two scenarios and we're gonna take, take the middle uh, of the two and that'll show us, you know, where our new ridership projections are, which then show us what, you know, what the new financial plan outlook is based on on those projections as we've stated the um, the projections will will be lower it's not you know there's no secret right now we're running in and around 60 percent of ridership the current you know the old McKinsey had us at 75 percent for this quarter and getting you know into the low 80s by the end of the year you know there's the the new projections will show lower assumptions in terms of a slower return to ridership and at least within the 2026 time frame you know ending at a lower percentage again all measured what was ridership in 2019 versus what is you know what percentage of 2019 ridership do we expect to be at you know over the next several years so that'll all be laid out. We've also, you know, July plan also, we go back to the agencies. They redo all their budgets. There's, um, you know, looking at all the expense categories. So things like increased electric power and fuel costs all get incorporated in. Any change we have in terms of um, headcount, we take the results of the current year, at least through April, and that gets, gets built in. The final results of 21 get built in. So there's a few moving parts that all come together to give give the board kind of an early look of what the financial plan looks like. So there's plenty of time to consider, you know, what consider what plans there should be as we get into the November plan and the December December budget. So that's the uh, process. Any questions, Andrew? Um, not to be snide, but will McKinsey look at ridership versus fair paying ridership? So, uh, yes, it, the, their projections lead us to a revenue number. 
And so uh, we incorporate the fair invasion of 2019 versus the fair evasion um, that we're experiencing now. And then the two different scenarios have different amounts of, you know, whether we're going to get basically reduce fair evasion or whether we're going to kind of stay where we are. And some of that depends that on what we do to our fair entry system as well, obviously. Right. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions on the process? Yeah. Did it make the same sort of judgments of uh, people beating the um, toll uh, system? Yeah. Did yes. they make the same sort of uh, estimations? Yep. Are they projecting those estimations as to how it will be after congestion pricing when they'll be using the same sort of mechanics? If, I mean, if you're losing the percentage now, I mean, how far, how far into it do you go? And do you know more about, what do you know more about? Uh, how many people jump the turnstile or how many cars beat the, beat the system? I think we actually have pretty good data on, on both. Um, you know, the... Again, I don't want to – congestion pricing is built into the model, right, mainly how it affects, um, you know, usage of our facilities and changes to transit and so forth. I don't want to oversell that McKinsey's able to, in a very detailed way, predict where evasion is going to go in terms of both on the, on the bridges and tunnels and on transit. You know, it's kind of very broad-based assumptions of like, do you stay where you are or do you get get better? But you know, they're you know, they're modeling the economics and you know the, the growth of the economy over time and jobs and different views on you know work from home based on surveys, so forth and so on. They they can't, you know, the their model's not going to predict, like, whether we're going to get better on fare evasion, whether we're going to get worse, whether we're going to get better on safety in the system or whether we're going to get worse, but trying to measure the outcomes if you're, you know, kind of doing better on both or doing, you know, worse on both. I, I think it may, it may be valuable for two things related to those assumptions. I think one, it, I think this board, since we're going to do the July plan in the board meeting, not in the committee, correct? correct? So it may be useful for A, for us to have a viewpoint about the specific assumptions, I, whether and yeah. B, whether they present or you, you present on their behalf. I'm indifferent. I assume the group is indifferent. But I think a discussion of what the inputs are to arrive at yeah. the outputs uh, would be useful. Can, I think that will be that. useful. Because otherwise, you're going to get all the questions. Yeah. And you're, we're paying them. We might as well have them get the questions. Well, I, I don't think they'll be presenting, but we can present. Whatever, whatever you think is the right process, but I think getting into the assumptions will be useful. Right. Um, I'm going to do something, Pat, hopefully you'll be okay with this. We're going to change the order a little bit with the chair's prerogative just to get to the action items because I have a quorum and I will lose my quorum at 3 o'clock when so many people become pumpkins or whatever they become when a uh, witching hour hits. So I'm going to jump to the action items. Uh, Mark, let's, let's do the first two, please, that you have, and then Kavesh, over to you for the third, okay? Sure. Mark, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, so there's uh, three action items. The first two um, I'll present, and staff is available to answer any questions you might have. So the first item seeks board approval for the MTA to establish uh, a not-to-exceed budget of $187 million and to finalize the procurement of an owner-controlled insurance program for projects covering the period June of 22 to June of 2023 uh, on behalf of New York City Transit, Long Island Railroad, Metro North, and the Small Business Development Program. And under this program, I think even uh, came up in the Capital Committee earlier, under this program, uh, the MTA purchases insurance on behalf of contractors and small con uh, subcontractors in order to reduce costs and achieve uh, economies of scale. So that's the first item. The second item seeks board authorization for staff to remit $6.5 million to the State Public Work Enforcement Fund for 2022. This is mandated by the state uh, law. It happens every year. Uh, state agencies and authorities are required to make these payments uh, in order to reimburse the State Department of Labor for costs uh, incurred to enforce uh, prevailing wage law. Okay. Any questions? Oh, actually. I, have a vote. Well, I guess we'll vote on them both together. Can I have a motion to approve these two action items? Second. Second. Questions, comments? None. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
extensions. Okay, motion carries. Kavash, uh, your uh, your uh, computer procurement, please. <laughs> well, Chair, before that, uh, we have uh, a third it action item oh, where sorry, we seek board, board approval thank for sorry. changes to the all agency procurement guidelines. So certain procurement related statutes were amended positively with the passage of the state budget bill. And as such, we hereby seek to amend the MTA's all agency procurement guidelines uh, to reflect same. The most significant change uh, was to increase the threshold for discretionary procurements from $1 million to $1.5 million for, uh, for MWBEs, SDVOBs, and small businesses. I'm actually very thrilled with regard to this because it expands the scope and we can, we can then increase our awards to these uh, MWBs can and SDVOs. Kavesh, what was our threshold? Was one it, a, million? it was a million, and now we went to one five. Now it's now because five. of the budget. Uh, because of so, it was passed legislation by the legislature. Legislation part of the budget. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It was Great. passed. It amended it, and then now what we are doing is subsequently amending our to reflect the changes. Guidelines. Okay, I got it. A motion to approve this. So moved. Second. Second. Any questions? And so just one more time, Kivash, for me, the, the impetus for this was state law changed and we're, mo we're modeling ourselves or marrying, not marrying, mirroring <coughs> what the state law is. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. And we were proponents of, of advocating for such change. For okay, great. Got so it. we asked for it. You got it, Toyota. Okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed abstentions. Okay. Now to your computer com procurement, please. Thank you, sir. So for Finance Committee approval this month, we have two items uh, for MTA headquarters totaling uh, $25.2 million. The first of which is a modification to extend the current contract with Quality and Assurance Technology Corp, Q&A, to, to furnish and deliver Dell PCs, laptops, and related accessories to the MTA on an as-needed basis for a period of three years and to add funding in the amount of $20,230,000 to purchase replacement desktops and laptop computers and related accessories. This modification will continue to provide the same favorable price adjustments and discount structure that we had previously negotiated in 2016. The estimated funding will cover the expected life replacement of 10,000 standard desktops, 5,000 standard laptops, and various peripherals and accessories. Uh, during this three-year extension, Q&A will provide the same discounts that were originally uh, negotiated, um, which, which include an average discount of 63% of the manufacturer's published list price for PCs and laptops and 50% discount on the accessories. Uh, it's also noteworthy that Q&A is a certified New York State Minority Business Enterprise. The second item is the ratification of a services contract to Sky Power Solutions in the estimated amount of $5 million to provide engineering analysis at various critical MTA facilities. And the overall scope relates to undertaking a comprehensive analysis, including identifying and providing the necessary corrective actions to critical IT-related infrastructure that the MTA has with regard to critical power distributed systems. I submit these two items for your approval. All right, you get a motion to approve this? All right, second? Second. All right, any questions? All right, so Kavesh, I have one in the first one. Just, just honestly, uh, so this company, help me understand, they're only providing the access to buy from Dell? No, so they are a certified reseller. Okay. So when we initially, uh, when we initially contracted with Dell in 2016, we saw the opportunity, uh, I think a year or two earlier before my time, to then be able to firstly award the transfer this contract. Still, the, 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 the paraphernalia and the equipment is, 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 is being supplied by Dell. They maintain the same pricing, and all we do is purchase it.
from a minority owned business. Right, you're not, but you're not here. That's not my question. Oh. Are, is QNA is the name of the company? Are yes. they simply buying for us? Or are they installing, loading no, up software? They are, they are just buying for us. Okay, so look, I, I, the, the average price of the desktop is $1,189. The average price of the laptop is $1,138. Um, that doesn't, I, I just typed in Dell.com. I mean, it's 1169 for one of the top desktops. It doesn't sound like a huge deal from our buying services, and I'm, I'm not opposed to this notion. Mm -hmm. I think, but I, I don't. It's not obvious to me that these incredible discounts from buying from one vendor, Dell.com being famous when Michael Dell founded the company for being a place you go and buy direct. It wasn't. It wasn't like you bought it through a third, but you bought it from Dell. So I'm just confused why we're using a third party for pricing that doesn't seem that advantageous, unless I'm not understanding what models we're getting. So, so well, I, I don't know. I mean, I just, I'm just i just raising the question. Since this hasn't been touched since two, 2016, you said. So yes. you were new, mo all of us are new. Well, I'm not new since then. So so we all, I also have one of my colleagues from IT here who could assist us with that, uh, Boris Mackay. This is on the <laughs> Chief Counsel thinks it's funny. <laughs> Hi, Forrest, how afternoon. are you? How are you, sir? The pricings are based on model, and the models that we purchase are not your uh, standard um, low RAM, and, uh, and they're higher strong power. So, so. so but Boris, I think it would be helpful for this committee to just see, and we don't do it today, you can, yeah, mm -hmm. you can tell us which model it is and tell us the street price. And show us the street price. Like if any of us went off, the, went and knocked on Dell.com right. and bought it, it's X. And Q&A is apparently getting it for X minus. So could you just show us? The, so again, the relationship between Q&A and Dell is really a, um, a procurement strategy to enable um, uh, MWBE goals. So that's not, that's not what I'm asking. I'm trying to ask if I went and bought it from Dell, it would cost X. And somehow Q&A is buying it for 30% less than I could buy it, you're telling me. I'm so so uh, my suggestion, Chair, is if I, I, could, I could probably, we could take this offline. Yes. I could give you information. That's what I'm saying. And I'd give it to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. I'm, and I'm happy. I'd, I'd like this, unless this is not, is this a rush? Do we have to vote on this? Do you must have this today? Uh, no. So if you wouldn't mind just bringing us a little bit yes. more, because I think there's a real opportunity to talk about I'm not. I'm not commenting on the MWBE comp, which you both, you've made many times. I'm commenting on whether we're getting advantageous pricing, and it's not clear from this that we are. Okay, thank you. All right, let's do a real, can you wait five more minutes? We're going to, you've got three. Okay, New York City Transit bus ops, go. Okay, so New York City uh, Transit procurement package includes four items which uh, with a proposed estimated expenditure of $11.4 million. Uh, Chair, this was uh, presented to the New York City Transit Committee, so items one to three are for contract modifications to extend the three e-hail pilot contracts with Arrow, Leap, and Limousis from June 1, 2022 to June 30th, 2023 in the aggregate amount of 11.4 million. Uh, I submit that item for Good. your approval. Motion. Okay. Second. Second. Any discussion, comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions. Okay, motion passes. And there's one more item, Chair, uh, which is merely an RFP authorizing resolution for the procurement of nine uh, R259 10-ton crane cars for New York City Transit. Motion. Motion. Second. No, but you, yeah, but we have to, mo we have to mo yeah, move we have the to money. Move again. Money. Mo so moved. Second. I'm sorry, second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed abstention. Hold on. Real estate items. David, floor. Okay. Do, do the six. highlights from Hamlet version so I can get you voted. I understand. Uh, we have two items for the MT. Both are policy related. They are amendments to existing policies. If you use one is a COVID related one, the other is a long term permanent change to our Grand Central licensing program. The third is for Metro North. It's an extension of the license of coffee table for retail space in Grand Central Terminal. The fourth is a lease agreement with City Goods to transform the retail mezzanine at 42nd and Port Authority. Uh, and we have a couple of slides if, if, the, if, the, if the committee has time to look at it. Uh, the fifth item is for Long Island Railroad. It's an easement with CUNY to use a portion of our right-of-way for a pedestrian uh, route. And the last is uh, with MTA Bridges and Tunnels, 
uh, it's an extension of an existing license with uh, with the September right, 11th. I'm going to cut you off. Yep. Let's vote on them. You can vote, and then you, will, you can show us your slides after. A motion to accept all six real estate items at once. Come a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Questions? Comments? Lisa, anything? We're going to do it again, okay. but I want to get her vote in so we can vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Oppose abstentions. Thank you very much. Sure. Now you can go back and do it more slowly so Lisa can actually hear it since we went so so fast. So I apologize. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry for that procedural rush, but I wanted to make sure that happened. So would you Thank like you, Hayden, for your time. Like Appreciate it. So let's just go back slowly through them, because I know you just rattled them off. So thank you. And thank you for your flexibility. Not at all. Go ahead. The first two items are for the MTA. For the first is a permanent modification to an existing board policy governing the licensing of retail space in Grand Central Terminal. Originally, the policy allowed for us to do direct marketing and two-year licenses to fill vacancies pre and during COVID. We changed it temporarily two years ago to go with three-year licenses. It has proved so successful for us. Uh, and we've gotten more traction because people will spend money on spaces for three-year licenses. We like to make it permanent going forward. The second is an extension, merely a one-year extension of a, a purely COVID-related uh, policy change that allows us greater flexibility in licensing vacant space to get more customer amenities into the principally the subways. We have not had good luck uh, getting a lot of them in because unlike the commuter rails or Grand Central, retail in the subways is 100% reliant on swipes. So until we, right where as a commuter railroad station, if it's in the middle of a downtown, they rely principally on walk-in trade. Grand Central relies a lot on walk-in trade, not just our riderships. The subway retail is, is unique in that regard. The third piece is our Grand Central Terminal Agreement. It's the extension of with a license of coffee table. It's an extension of the term to allow them to, to, to marry up with the, with the New York State Liquor Authority's license. Um, and city goods I'll talk about in a minute. The fifth item is with the Long Island Railroad. It's allowing CUNY to use a portion of our right-of-way for pedestrian connection in, within uh, the campus buildings. And the last has to do with the tribute and lights that has long been on the roof of the battery garage. It's an extension of their ability to do this over time. So going back to the transit item, we've been looking pre-COVID and during COVID for a really creative reuse of our mezzanines. And if you look at Rock Center, uh, that's a case where we, that's leased out to, to the Rock to Tishman, and we RFP'd that, and we'll be coming back to you with the results of that RFP later this year. But we've also been looking at 74th and Roosevelt, looking at Times Square, but we focus on 42nd and 8th, and partnered with New York City Transit pre-COVID to offer this publicly, and we received two proposals. The one we're suggesting is with City Goods, whose this is uh, this is the current plan for the mezzanine. To the left is south, to the right is north, Port Authority is, is, a, is above. And right now, the retail is very traditional, glass enclosed of varying depths. They're looking to completely blow this out. And I'll show you, here's an, exa oh, here's an example of, of looking west. And this is what it looked like when they're done. Completely opening it up and creating pot pods. Let me go back. It's going the wrong way. Okay, here's an example of an internal space on the west side, and this is it reimagined. Removing all of the glass uh, storefronts and making much more fluid space for circulation and also being mindful of, of, uh, of distancing. The concept is to create these retail pods that open and close with security partitions you see on the far right. This is a better example. When open, this is how the queue would go outside of the path of travel of our, of our, of our customers. So keeping the retail within the space. The most important improvement is the $15 million overall that includes utilities. And the biggest challenge we have in the subway system is our inability to deliver water and appropriate electrical power to tenants that have 2022 requirements, not 1922 requirements. It's a huge challenge. It really, really is. And it, it, it results in less rent because the tenant has to put up more cash up front. So we think this is a very transformational uh, use of this, uh, of this uh, uh, mezzanine, and we anticipate it being open sometime in 2024. Questions? What is the term of the lease agreement? It's, 50, it's 30 years with a couple of 10-year options. 
So we really need to give them the, the type of uh, term necessary to amortize these improvements. And the total value is $6.2 million? Net present value over the term. But again, $15 million capital improvements up front. Other questions? Can you tell us a bit about the vendor, please? Because this seems like a pretty meaningful and novel approach to using retail real estate, and therefore their experience would be relevant. Over 100 retail franchises in the tri-state area, ranging from Dunkin' Donuts to Taco Bell, what have you. And one of the requirements of the lease agreement will be a certain portion of the retail must be New York-centric type retail, food and beverage, or dry goods. It's similar to what, how we curate the uh, dining concourse at Grand Central Terminal. We want a lot for more localized uh, New York-centric retail and food and beverage. Sharif, did you have something? Yeah, I just had a question about the um, price points for the retail, because I know, you know, you certainly have seen in some airports and some controversy on the price points for some of these vendors. So um, what kind of attention is being given to that? We don't regulate the price You don't point. regulate that We at all. don't regulate it, no. The only regulation is in this building, uh, the, both the newsstand and Rosen's. Uh, we have uh, a purview over their pricing because they are, in effect, are the company cafeteria. Right. Other than that, we're looking to have the maximum return on, uh, on, our, on our real estate. So consequently, we don't impose price controls. Good. Other questions? Oh, please. Yeah. How, how long is this deal for? I, I missed that. It's 30 years. It's on the, it's 30 years with, um, I think, two 10-year options. Wow. You will have been on this board by about 50 years yes. by that point, Andrew. Right. Right. All right, David, your information items? Um, two acquisitions of property in connection with our ADA initiatives. Yeah, please, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, all right, so we'll uh, thank you. you don't know, nothing you want to share on them? Fine. Okay. All right, so, Pat, sorry we, we jumped over you. Uh, Sharif and is Blanca still there? Sammy's there. Uh, maybe for their benefit, though, can you just give them 30 seconds on what is Finance Watch? It may be obvious, but I think it's worthwhile just describing what's in the, the purview and then give us your watching. Sure. Um, fi finance Watch is a standing item uh, for every monthly meeting of the Finance Committee. Uh, the intent is to really, uh, for this report, is to, to summarize all of our capital markets activity that has occurred since the last meeting and that is forecasted to occur before the next meeting. So you get a sense of what's going on in terms of MTA borrowings, remarketings, et cetera, um, where, where we need capital markets access. Um, in addition to, to this report, we've also made it a point to make sure that the board members receive a, an email update whenever new or up updated disclosure is released into the market. So all of you should have received a, a, a very detailed email from Marcia Tanian on Friday describing um, our newest bond credit that we'll be introdu introducing to the market next week. This is the uh, TBTA sales tax bonds, and these are bonds that will be uh, secured by a portion of the sales tax that's being deposited into the Central Business District capital lockbox. So uh, this is a $170 million revenue stream in, in uh, city, I should say, state fiscal year 2021, and then growing by 1% annually. So this will be an important fund source for the 20 to 24 capital program and future capital programs. Most notably, though, anything that goes into the lockbox cannot be used for operations. This is strictly to be used for capital. So that's, that's um, uh, sort of in a nutshell what, what, we, what we do at Finance Watch. We, we really try to give you a sense of what's going on in the market uh, with respect to our bonds and, 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 and notes and, um, and variable rate demand bonds and so forth. So what is going on in the market? <laughs> Well, the, as, as we've seen, uh, particularly since, um, since the Federal Reserve did act to, um, to increase short-term rates, we've seen a, a general rise in interest rates across the board, uh, most notably, you know, the Treasury market, which, you know, is, is a, I, I would say, a, an important indicator for the municipal tax exempt market. Um, we've seen rates uh, increase dramatically. Um, in addition to that, we're seeing a, a slight inversion of the yield curve, meaning a longer term, you know, 30-year bond 
is, is going to be less expensive than something like a 20-year or even a 15-year bond. And so that inversion is something that um, has us a little concerned because we, are, we typically issue bonds across the yield curve from anywhere from two to three years all the way out to 30 or 35 years even. Um, so we're, we're seeing volatility in the market. That, that's why I think this um, introducing this new credit next week, uh, we'll be pricing um, for taking retail orders next Wednesday and pricing institutionally on Thursday. Um, this credit has, uh, is unique in, in the sense that uh, the revenue stream is, uh, is available to us without appropriation, so it's a non-appropriation based revenue stream. So we received a AAA rating from Fitch and a AA, AA plus rating from S&P. So I think we're really um, poised to, to uh, you know, show our best foot forward into the market with this credit. And you know, we'll, I'll report next month on how, how the pricing goes. Any questions? Thank you, Pat. Sure. I think we're uh, at, a, at a. You need something? Sure. So for HQ, there were two items. One was the Q and A, and then there was SCA. Um, are we tabling the SCA for the five million dollars? No, no. Th well, we lost our quorum, so. Right. So, so we so have we're to table both. Well, I, we don't. I don't have a quorum. To get to, it's no. I mean, we can talk about it, but we can't. We're just make, clarifying. Yeah, that, we, that with that the Q and A, we're intent. definitely going to ask for some more data. I apologize. I should have sk skated in the ske, <laughs> but I didn't. So there you go. Okay. But we can pass that as a board, and I'm sure you can provide information on the uh, computer pricing that maybe we can take it up at the full board on Wednesday. Yeah, Chair, uh, it's also. Um, I just checked on on my notes. They do provide additional services as well, but I'll give you a write-up on it. it may, again, if you're not in a rush, it may be fine to do Q&A next month. Uh, next month, we have a July meeting, so maybe we do Q&A next month because my guess is that maybe we'll spend 10 minutes talking about it. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, you had something else you want to say? Yeah, I, I know we um, moved quickly on the OSIP program, the Owner Controlled Insurance. Uh, Jamie gave a bigger presentation at C and D. Again, this is, um, and we've got uh, Laudwin uh, Pemberton from here at MTA in uh, risk management, and Lauren Gregory from Alliant, who really worked really hard on this, um, working with C and D to drive, drive, you know, insurance costs in our capital program are significant, generally around, you know, they grown to seven to eight percent based on project cost and you know working uh, some magic in terms of competition among the market and slicing and dicing the risk we've gotten the you know the the cost down into the the mid five percent range so I just didn't want to uh, go without saying that good good work by by all and good coordination between risk management and C and D on finding creative ways to save money. I think the quote, uh, uh, actually, maybe it was Jamie, I think the quote in the in the Capital Program Committee, he described the savings as being the equivalent of uh, making a Station 88 compliant. And I think so, sir, if, you're, uh, if your work was done to help put a Station 88 compliance, that is uh, money well saved and put to good use, so well done. On that note, any further business for this committee? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, have a see you Wednesday.